Well, hello all. Today I want to tell you what is wrong with the South African physical sciences teaching system. Now, I taught physical science for 46 years, so I think I know a little bit about what is wrong with it. The first thing that's wrong with it is the same stuff is being taught today as was taught to me. I learned the stuff in my grade 12. And since then, they've invented the ballpoint pen, television, the internet, computers. You know, we've, we've gone a long way, and yet we are teaching the same stuff that I learned at school. Second point, I didn't use any of this stuff in my normal everyday life. I'm the only person who actually might have used some of this stuff because I took it and I ingested it and I regurgitated it back to my students. So I earned a living for 46 years out of teaching this garbage. Now, I want to ask you laymen to have a look at paper one. There's two papers. There's the chemistry and the physics. Paper one is the physics. Have a look at this stuff, and we are taking the best and the brightest South African students, and this is what we are feeding them. So we have about 20 weeks of physics teaching to teach about 20 questions. And let's start with question number two. Question number one is multiple choice on many different topics that we're going to cover now. So let's have a look at question number two. And all of you, even if you're a layman, can understand it. Here's the ground. Here are two blocks, and we're pulling uh, on a string at an angle of theta. Now, let me tell you, physics is about solving problems in South Africa. We don't have a problem of dragging blocks a on a friction-filled ground. You know, since even the Egyptians, they used logs and wheels. So why are we dragging blocks attached by string? I've never needed to know how to do this in my life. And here's the other problem number three. In our day, we used to actually at school drag blocks along desks with a spring balance and work out and we'd use a protractor and we'd add the angle and we'd measure it. Then we'd do the theory and we'd see our ah, theory and practical match. Do you know what? Since I went to school, we have had two generations of teachers. And what are the teachers all terrified of? practical work, doing anything, using these little fingers for anything other than writing or typing on a keyboard. So the, the equipment in the schools is atrocious and only in the very most private schools are you going to actually find people bother to drag blocks along the, the, the surface. And it's a useless skill. Now let's go to question number two. Vertical projectile motion. Well, this is question number three, but it's second topic. It's about st throwing stuff up and down. We don't need gunnery sergeants in South Africa. We need one or two of them. But in the syllabus, we're confined to shooting it straight up, a projectile straight up, and it comes straight down. Now, anyone knows that you don't shoot a mortar straight up because it's going to come straight down on you. So we confine our, the brightest and the best, to throwing stuff up and coming straight down and working problems to do with it. I've never needed to use it. Can you think of a case where you need to know how you throw stuff up and time how long it comes down for? No, it's worthless. We've now wasted two weeks of their valuable time. So let's go on to question number three, momentum. We're going to crash two trolleys coming in different directions together. This is how their velocity of a trolley x changes. You can see it starts with a velocity in a certain direction and it ends up with the same going in the same direction with a lesser velocity. So obviously, I mean, I can see that this trolley had more momentum than the other trolley and that's why when the two trolleys collided, it carried on going in its direction. Never in my life, unless maybe I was in insurance and we were having a car accident report and a minibus crashed against the little minivan and the minibus kept on going in that direction but i mean it's just irrelevant so look at the mathematics everything is just maths that's point number four physics is being captured by the maths department they always advertise for physics and maths teachers and the maths teachers say that phys teaching physics is harder than teaching maths so here we have the, one of the hardest subjects on the planet, and what are we 
teaching them maths. Oh boy. So now we just have physics has been turned this beautiful subject of dealing with practical problems, inventions, saving the world, looking for problems in society. We don't have a problem of crashing two things together and, and measuring them, the changes of the mass. And you know what? Teachers are not going to do this um, in practice. Now, I used to do it. I used to make a YouTube video and you crash two things together and you film them and then from the frames of the YouTube you can work out the change of velocity or the acceleration changes. So I used to like the practical aspect of this and and maybe I, by doing it practically you can show by filming it frame by frame and knowing how how long each frame is you can work out if you film it next to a ruler the actual change of the velocity of the two trolleys and you know in the old days we used to use ticker tape and we'd bang two trolleys together but no one knows what ticker tape is these days or ticker timers dotting onto a piece of ticker tape and then when they collide you see the dots suddenly get fast, uh, closer together or further apart and then you can work out no one does that anymore so we can form things we've got better methods of of working that out now let's go on to question number five um, so here we are dragging again another block up a rough friction filled incline and then it comes onto a so this is like an energy work energy theorem problem so we are working out the changes of energy of a block going up a hill do you see how we confine to these blocks on surfaces we almost like we're back to question number one and just the energy changes of the block and the height differences, the changes in perhaps potential energy and kinetic energy during the problem. I've never used it in my life. I mean, when I think of all the things in the world that I'd like to, that I could use in practical um, ways. So now we come to Doppler, and that Doppler is to do with the change of frequency or the observed change of frequency as say a racing car approaches you go ee, high frequency and then it comes ooh, and then as it goes past you go ooh, ee, so that's Doppler and what have they got again a very mathematical approach they've got the frequency of the source that's what its natural frequency say its natural frequency of a racing car is as it comes towards you go ee, and as it goes away from you go oh so here is its actual frequency, here is its uh, the listener, here's the frequency, there's the slope of the graph, very mathematical. And from, you're supposed to know that the source, the ratio of the, of the frequency that you hear versus the source, you're supposed to be able to work out the one from the other. So you've got the slope of the graph, you've got one, and you're going to use very mathematical, this is not a simple problem, I think to do with when you add maths to physics, you turn an interesting, easy problem into now. Oh, look at that. They're looking at maths again. You see that there's a graph there. Wasn't there graphs? There was another graph. Yes, there's another graph. Maths. Graphs. I've got nothing against maths and graphs, but stick it in maths. Keep it there. So now we're talking about name one application in the medical field of the phenomenon of Doppler, so they use it in ultrasound, etc. And it's just Doppler, you know, Doppler can be very interesting because the universe is expanding and from the Doppler effect, the, the red shift of the universe. Now let's talk about that. Let's go to the James Webb space. Let's talk about that. I'm not at the moment here trying to uh, suggest alternatives. I'll say that for a, another video. I'm just saying, trying to say that this stuff's irrelevant. Okay, so here we have charged spheres there and there, and so this is now hanging stationary there. Apparently, another charged sphere. Um, you got M and N carrying a charge and so on. So now these things seem to be balanced, and now we're dealing with charges again. Charges on great charges have been around since ancient 
you know, a long time ago, and here we're dealing with Coulomb's law. Oh, this is ancient stuff, folks. I did it at school where we charged Van der Graaff generators. I mean, you rubbed static and we stuck balloons to our head, first of all, and I'll rub it against and stick the balloon to our shirt and little picked up little piece of paper. It's all very fascinating, but it's useless. And so here we've got to work out the size of the charges. Okay, question eight. We have an electric circuit. Now, I love electricity. I love electric circuits. This is one topic I really think we should be focusing a lot of time on. But look, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm still recovering from COVID-19. Look at the circuit. There's all ohmic resistors. In other words, there's no semiconductors. There's no modern appliances. There's nothing modern in this circuit. And look, they try to complicate it. They've got one, two, three, four, five resistors. <clears throat> and there's a voltmeter, an ammeter, a second voltmeter. There's internal resistance. They're going to use EMF and potential difference at the terminals and so on. And this, while, I mean, this is a totally impractical circuit. This is not something that's going to be of any use. And then they give the reading on the ammeters 3.5, calculate the total external resistance of the circuit. <coughs> so, is they supposed to, I presume, they're going to, you can see that these, two are in series i suppose they're going to add them three plus two is five then that one's in, in parallel with those so you're going to then you're going to work out there's a formula one upon the five plus one upon the one equals one upon the total resistance so then you've got that then you're going to add that one and then you're going to add that well this is the external resistance and then when you add that one you've got the total resistance of the circuit so, so there we see it's 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 great, but why can't we do electronics? Let's do electronics, please, folks. Let's do electronics. So this circuit is. I mean, they struggle. I always found my students struggle with it. It's probably the most practical thing, but we still haven't got to the most basic things. LEDs. Oh, there's so much you can do with electronics. This is just a worthless circuit. Going again back to all the little resistors that we used in my day. And look, there's not a single, I mean, not a, no students these days actually put together a circuit like this and actually work with it and play with it. Now, if they did that, there'd be some practical use to it. And look, it just continues on. If we, I will each of the following change if we, um, the power dissipated one. Anyway, I don't even want to go th to it. It's the same circuit, I think. Yes. But it's <clears throat> impractical. Okay, let's go to question number nine. Here we've got a motor. Now this this is a DC motor, they tell us. A DC generator. Okay, so someone's turning it. What's coming in is um, mechanical energy. There's the north, there's the south, and then it's turning in a certain direction, and then they've got questions on the generator. Now this could be quite interesting, because um, we do need to have, get energy from renewable sources and we if we could spend the same time now instead of this being a very theoretical mathematical problem of the generator what's the direction of the induced current and we're going to use instead of Fleming's left hand motor rule we're going to right hand um, generator rule so we're going to take our right hand and we're going to stick it in three different directions and then we're going to um, work out which direction the current flows. It's totally impractical. In real life, you would take an, a, a multimeter and you'd measure which is the positive and which is the negative. And anyway, no generator looks like a square, a square, a wire, and here's your brushes and your commutator. So, um, 
so anyway, it's very theoretical questions on the, the um, production of power by this and yin. Then they do mention the root mean square, probably voltage that it generates, meaning the highest voltage. It says the maximum voltage is 90 volts. And then they're going to find the root mean square voltage and so on. And they're going to draw again. They're drawing little graphs somewhere here, I think. Um, they drew a graph, I think. Sketch a graph output of the voltage. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's um, what do they say? This was a DC generator, so it's going to produce a little DC humped voltage. It's not going to be a sine wave voltage, and then it's going to be, they're going to use root mean square to find out the actual height. Well, they get, we know that its maximum voltage is 90, so it's going to go minus 90, plus 90, etc. And then the wall socket supplies a voltage and current on into an electric kettle. Calculate the average energy dissipated in the kettle in two minutes. Now, this actually is a worthwhile question to work out how much your <clears throat> how much energy your kettle takes, and then you know link it to the cost it costs your parents to 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 operate this kettle. <clears throat> and this kettle has a, a resistance of thirty two ohms. So here is perhaps for four marks a useful question. Question number ten. Light is incident on a photoelectric cell connected to a battery and a sensitive ammeter, as shown. And this is the photoelectric effect. Now, this again could be useful if we were dealing with solar panels. And this is the, the theory behind solar panels. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, then they've got different threshold frequencies of light. And they say how much current is produced. So current is produced by these photons knocking off the electrons especially photons that have more energy than the threshold amount of energy and then what happens if you um, change the conditions a little bit and then there's the data sheet so although this could be useful it's not it is just some real theory theory stuff about energy of electrons and um, frankly, if, if I was installing and using solar panels, this is more or less useless. So I'm going to just stop and restart it. So in conclusion, what is wrong with education in South Africa? Well, the problem is that most of the learners who leave school, almost 50% of them can't find jobs on leaving school. So we have invested 12 years and a huge expense to basically produce people who can't do anything that's worthwhile. I mean, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If people cannot find jobs, we are not teaching them something that's useful. So <clears throat> we need to take the best and the brightest, and not all of them go to university, and many of them are going to just use the science in their everyday life but then you can see that none of the stuff that I've gone through they will ever use and even if they go to university that is not stuff they would use anyway so we need to instead of wasting all these resources on something that is basically utterly pointless and useless let's find useful things to teach our learners while we have them for these 12 precious years <clears throat> and even in education tertiary education so i don't blame the learners obviously it is amalusi and angie mochseka who's in charge of amalusi who needs to change the syllabus i thought when caps was coming in, in around 2012 2013 that we would have a brand new syllabus that might be practical and useful but what did we end up with the same old same old the same old tired western education system which does not work in south africa you cannot transplant an education system from the uk and the usa to south africa and hope that it's going to work and i don't even think that this stuff works for anybody even in the uk and the usa so Let's not perpetuate a syllabus that is just garbage and useless.
Let's find stuff that's useful. I mean, we've invented, I, there wasn't even a ballpoint pen or a television around when I was born. And, you know, there were no computers, internet, and there's so many wonderful devices and inventions and driverless car and AI. And there's so much going on in science. There's the James Webb um so we can look at a telescope where we can look to the origins of the universe. We can go to the quarks, muons, gluons, uh, Higgs bosons. We don't teach any of that at school. We don't teach James Webb at school. We don't teach anything that's relevant at school. We don't teach about the age of the universe. So all the science is a wonderful thing. It's about how the universe works. And then when you get problems, how to solve them, how to form inventions, we don't encourage any creativity or inventiveness or entrepreneurial spirit or practical science that you can use. The syllabus is dead. It was dead when I was being taught the same stuff. And it's no more useful today. It's far less useful. It's far more irrelevant. So we just have to change the syllabus and if we're going to throw so much money and resources at this we must make sure that it, we are producing some benefit practical benefit that people can actually use science and science is just such a wonderful thing how to find problems with our physical universe and how to solve the problems and how to make life easier and inventions we know that there's so much going on in science Let's just get it into the South African school physical science system.